My name is Ilsa Hampton, the CEO of Meaningful Aging Australia. We're really delighted to have you all here with us today for this conversation about spirituality and dementia with a person who's living with dementia. As we begin, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands where we are gathered. So you might like to put in the chat the name of the traditional owners of the land where you are. For me, it's Sorundri people of the Kulin Nations. I'm here, as you know, in Melbourne. I pay my respects to elders, past, present and emerging. And in particular at Meaningful Aging Australia, we honour the spiritual strength of Australia's First Peoples. Now, um, flexibility is the name of the game at Meaningful Aging Australia and probably anywhere that we're working uh, to do with aged care. So unfortunately, Christine Bryden um, was unwell and unable to join us today. We put in um, quite a bit of work to see if we could find someone else to uh, have a conversation with me, someone who's living with dementia and able and willing to talk about spirituality um, so that you could all listen into the conversation. We weren't able to get someone to talk with live at such short notice, but I am really pleased to let you know that we do have a conversation that did happen live this morning uh, with my colleague Jackie and Kate Swaffer. Some of you might know Kate. She's an independent researcher, poet and author, an award-winning campaigner for the rights of people with dementia and older persons in Australia and globally. She has a Master of Science in Dementia Care, a Bachelor of Psychology, a BA, she's a Graduate Diploma in Grief Counselling and a retired nurse. She's a co-founder and past chair and CEO of Dementia Alliance International and elected board, me board member of Alzheimer's Disease International. So um, what we're going to do now is participate in uh, watching and listening to Jackie talk with Kate using the questions um, that we had also set up uh, with Christine. We've had a massive amount of interest in this session today. So I'm sure we're going to be bringing you a lot more uh, in 2022 around dementia and spirituality, in particular hearing from people who are living with dementia directly. So we'll start the recording now and um, I'll see you at the end. Hi, Kate. Thanks so much for joining us here today. I wonder if a good place to start for those who don't know you would be for you just to talk a little bit about your dementia journey. Sure. Thanks, Jackie. Um, and thanks for inviting me to uh, fill the very big shoes of my friend and colleague, Christine Bryden. Um, she's been a mentor for me for a long time as well. Um, and to, I think a lot of other people. Uh, so it's a pleasure to be here, but I guess my own um, experience of dementia, uh, I actually worked in a Adelaide's first secure dementia ward back when I first finished my, first came to the city in, in 1977. And then I've been a family carer or care partner, I prefer to say, to three people that I've two were family members and I was legal guardian to three people who all died with dementia in residential settings um, some of them fairly badly treated um, but nowhere to go with that and mm. in mm. 2008 as a married working mother of two teenage sons um, you know busy life I was also studying as a mature age student uh, I uh, I had the bombshell diagnosis of having young onset dementia and you know I worked in dementia I didn't know that young people got dementia so we got very little training in dementia or aging generally um, and you know in all the work that I'd done as a nurse I, I did only ever see older people in the later stages of dementia so it was quite a shock to be yeah. diagnosed age 49 and I think um, you know, what was worse for me, and I didn't realise it at the time, but what was happening that I started to become what I've often used the term a non-human being. People stopped looking at me, people stopped talking to me, um, I lost my job and nobody advised me in the dementia space that I had disability rights under the CRPD to be supported to stay at work. Um, there was no medication available for the type of dementia that I'm supposed to have. Um, so I was given what I've termed prescribed disengagement, give up work, give up study, get your end of life affairs in order and start going to respite aged care a day a month to get used to it. So oh, you can yeah. imagine going from a full-time married working mother, definitely with 
lots of challenges cognitively because otherwise I wouldn't have been diagnosed with dementia to suddenly being told to go home and die. Um, and, you know, the lucky thing I think that happened for me was that being a university student, which was a hobby, it wasn't for a new career, I wanted to go to uni as a young person and didn't have that opportunity, so I went nursing yeah. instead. The university simply taught me to see and supported the symptoms of dementia as acquired disabilities, which is what we need the healthcare sector to do desperately. Yeah. Um, and, you know, the WHO, World Health Organization, has been describing dementia I used to say the leading cause of disability and dependence. They now say a major cause of disability and dependence globally. So we need the rest of the mm. professionals to start embedding that in their work. So, you know, if I'd had a stroke age 49, I know that I would have been very quickly offered rehabilitation. And if possible, if the stroke wasn't too bad, I would have been supported to go back to work perhaps in a new capacity with disability support. And yet with dementia yeah. age 49, I'm told to go home and get die and get ready to die. I mean, it's just... It just doesn't make sense. It beggars belief, doesn't it? Yeah, so my experience of, of what the late Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. spoke about, that sense of otherness, I felt that ever since diagnosis and I experienced that regularly. And, you know, I, I, I've got lots of Aboriginal friends and colleagues and they look at what's happened to me and now they know of other people with dementia through my work they say it's almost sort of like a version of racism except it's against a health condition yeah. um, and I certainly face almost daily discrimination lots of different stigmas um, very subtle paternalism nihilism reductionism and a complete lack of access to disability support to an, allow me to engage in civil society like you do and like everybody else yeah. can. So it's been an interesting um, 13 years to say the least, but also there's been lots of gifts along the way. Um, and I don't know, the irony of losing cognitive capacity for me, it's actually given me a much better clarity around about life than I ever had before yeah um, so you know it's been definitely um uh disempowering to start with and it's been empowering since i decided to treat and support the symptoms of disabilities and just yeah. get back to living instead of waiting to die we're all going to die anyway so well exactly why, why, why do that <laughs> at diagnosis exactly isn't it i mean you know it, it's we've been having conversations here about how it's still prevalent in situations and settings where you would think it would be otherwise by now that um you know people are people look at um people living with dementia who may be disengaged or disconnected for a number of reasons but then they're characterized as um they're nothing like who they used to be. They've had, That's you know, right. a complete personality change. Um, but surely a person is still a whole person, the person Absolutely. they've always been, regardless of diagnosis. And I, and I think the personality starts almost immediately after diagnosis. And I've seen this around the world. People just give up. They take on learned helplessness in, in the course I did with my husband after diagnosis. I was told to give up everything. My husband was actually told in a different room, we were separated, um, that he would have to give up work soon and take over everything. And so that sets up a, a power imbalance and that's why he detests the term carer and I dislike it too. And I, I nicknamed him back in 2012, my backup brain. So that, that, well, one of the okay. kids helped us reframe his, his yeah. and their role because, mm -hmm. you know, the funny thing about getting diagnosed with dementia, suddenly everything that went wrong in my family was my fault because I've got dementia. 
you know, even when the lunchbox is left home on the counter. So um, it, it's <laughs> funny, you beat the statistical odds in being wrong once you've got dementia. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, but uh, I've forgotten totally where I was going with that, so it doesn't really matter. But, <laughs> but you know, the, oh, it was one of the my sons said, "Hey, Mum, backup brain's great. It's just like your computer. Yes. You back it up. Yes. You only go to the backup when the computer crashes. So that reframing oh, up like that taught that my great? family not to step in and take over unless it was dangerous. They wait for me to ask." That's sensational. I just love that. I've got goosebumps. That is such a compelling reframe as well, isn't it? Mm -hmm. um, you know, this sense of, you know, the person is the person no matter what. Um, we have um, a tool um, at Meaningful Aging Australia that we like to use called Connect2. And that's, um, it's a tool that helps conversations. We use it to um, help others understand um, what we mean by spirituality. Yeah. The sense that spirituality is what provides meaning and purpose and connection in our lives. And it can come from a, a number of places. So Connect2 is this tool that sort of encourages um, aged care services as well to sort of think about conversations with, with the, the people who are accessing aged care services um, to sort of think about how and where spirituality um, is in their lives, how they make connections and meaning and purpose. You know, is it with nature? Is it with self? Is it with others? Is it through creativity or is it something bigger? You know, is it something more transcendent like religion? Um, how, how is, how is that important to you? What, what, how do you see spirituality and how it sort of fits into your life? Well, I've been thinking a lot about spirituality and also about my own faith and religion a lot the last few years. And, and I've actually had some uh, spiritual counselling because I used to be a deeply Christian Catholic. In fact, I converted to Catholicism after my son was born. Um, and since dementia, I don't feel that anymore. And I don't know whether I've forgotten it or whether I don't feel it. Right. So, you know, that's an interesting question, but spirituality and religion and faith, I think we get them mixed up as being one and the same thing and yeah. use them interchangeably in everything. Um, but to me, spirituality, it's, it's very abstract, it's subjective, it's mm. very different to any kind of religious faith. Yes. Uh, it could, could be a connection to God, it could be a connection to going down to the beach, it could be, you know, to, to me, my garden, I'm, it's a very spiritual yes. time for me right. in my garden. Um, it definitely, uh, I, I think that sense of... Uh, of being at home, you know, the, the connection with land to me is part of my mm. spirituality. Mm. Uh, and also um, it is or it should be, if it isn't in aged care particularly, it should be associated um, and part of quality of life and meaning of life. Um, and, you know, I, I think the Latin word spirit, it's the origin of the word spiritual, which means apparently to blow or to breathe. Um, and has come to mean that which give, gives life to your soul. Um, and I was reading yeah. up about this recently um, in 2019, uh, someone called Chris, I've forgotten his last name, explained it as, as a, a journey or a search for the truth. And I've been on a search for my truth yeah. for a long time. And I think I'm there, believe it or not, but I still don't know whether I, I'm a Christian anymore. I don't know whether I've forgotten my faith or whether yeah. I have a different, um, whether it's different for me now. I don't actually know that. Uh, and, and my spiritual advisors, Christian and uh, non-Christian, have all said, just go with the flow. Apparently, even Mother Teresa in the last few years of her life didn't feel God anymore. So I, I feel like I, I'm doing my two strong female mentors and my great grandmother my or three actually my great granny my grandma and my 
aunt who died this year and you know their purpose in life was just to serve others not to be mean to themselves not to the detriment of themselves but just to serve others and to be kind and yeah I think that's a pretty good way to live so whether I am Christian or I'm not Christian anymore is irrelevant to me yes I'm kind of living that lifestyle yeah. anyway exactly um, compassion for self compassion yeah. for others yeah Mm. But, you know, it's changed for me a lot. You know, I think having been brought up in a, a very strict Methodist family and then I, I left left Christian faith as a young person for a while because the, the leader of the church ran away with, um, left his oh. wife and four children and ran away with one of the young girls in the oh, yeah. town and that kind of you know, I was young and impressionable, probably about 15. I went, that's it. I'm having nothing to do with yeah. God. So, you know, those, those things inform you and, and form Absolutely. you. Absolutely. And then um, I, I had a partner who took his life and, and that kind of brought me back to some Christian faith. And um, mm. I, I still had Christian faith until 10 years ago. And I don't know what happened to it. But that doesn't mean I haven't got it. I'm just not sure what happened to it because I don't feel it anymore. So that's, you know, it would be an interesting study for any academics. Who Isn't are, it? I mean, um, just that that notion of spirituality being such a fluid thing, yeah. that, that the way it shows up for you, the way you feel it and experience it can alter and change without your brain being involved in it. Yeah, exactly. You know? <laughs> yeah. Which and experiences re-inform you. And mm. they change you, you know, like like mm. having the, the 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 chap who I thought was just, you know, like a walking god himself almost. And I've been going to, you know, youth yep. church youth groups for years. Yes. Many did that, and it was just like, you know, you don't realize at that age that parents make mistakes, that leaders make mistakes. Of course, you know, we're all humans. So, so I, you know, I feel bad, but I was a bit harsh in my heart towards him back then. Um, but that's kind of uh, the way it is. So, um, and, and I think it's like that for everyone. Yeah. I, I had a, a long conversation with uh, the, my children went to a Jesuit Catholic school and um, I, it was in my days as a chef and, and I used to cook for the Jesuit community in Adelaide um, for a number of Gosh, years. you've had it every Sunday. I had some, <laughs> one, some interesting hats. My father, farmer, thought it was far better to me for me to wear a chef's hat because it was at least dead meat he thought it was horrific that I used to work in operating theaters oh you know fancy all that blood and guts so he I think he saw chefing as a career move up <laughs> and I, I loved it I, I absolutely loved it but I was yarning to the, the Catholic uh, Jesuit headmaster of the school one day and he said to me what why did you become a Catholic you know I, I'd heard somewhere that you you converted and by then I'd become, I suppose he would have called me, a, I think he did call me a lapsed Catholic because I wasn't going to mass every weekend. I wasn't going to confession, um, but I still did believe deeply in God, uh, but in a, you know, just I didn't need to go to church for that to be, um, for that to, to still happen. But I said to him, isn't, isn't religion like football? And he said, what do you mean? And I, I said rugby because he originally comes from Sydney. I said, well, you know, we don't know if it's the same God, whether Muslims, Catholics, you know, whatever the God is that people believe in, it's a belief. Maybe it's the same one. And I like football. We all like football, or well, some do. But for everyone that likes football, it's the same game but a different club. Yeah. And after quite a long debate, he actually agreed with me. So we don't know if it's all, you know, we can't say it isn't and we can't say it is. Yeah. That's faith for you, isn't it? Yeah. It is, yeah. yeah. So, um, you know, I, I think in the dementia space, and I've had a lot to do with people with dementia from around the world um, since, particularly since... Um, co-founding and setting up Dementia Alliance International, which is a not-for-profit um, charity as registered in, in the USA. But we're, a, you know, 501c3 in the US, but we have members in now 49 countries around the world. 
uh, and we provide free membership and free support for our members as well as advocacy um, which we've taken to the highest yes. levels and and also you know, education for healthcare professionals service providers and academics um, but something that I discovered probably about six years ago now is that we had members in the US and then I discovered also in Australia who were being kicked out of their church because they had dementia and their oh, ministers no. of their faith were telling them that they'd obviously been evil and so they weren't welcome at church anymore. So, you know, that is a slightly different sort of stigma to say what you might hear of in Africa, or, you know, Nigeria, somewhere like that, where they think it's an evil spirit's got into yeah. the person. Yeah. Um, that's an outdated myth too, but we still have that happening in Anglo-Saxon educated rich countries. Um, so I, I was pretty stunned by that and I reached yeah. out to... Uh, a minister of religion here who was working uh, you know as a pastor in an aged care provider group and he said oh that's very common in Australia too and I had no idea that that would oh. ever happen um these are by Christians so you go if Christians aren't supporting other Christians just because they've got dementia well maybe they shouldn't be leading their churches those conversations that I was talking about, we were sort of quite stunned that thinking that, you know, that sense of they've changed personality and not who they were anymore. We thought that was like the the kind of the the peak. But what you're sharing here is it's there's a a lot of it feels like a lot of fear, doesn't it? It does feel like yeah. fear, but it's also ignorance. Yeah. You know, it's ignorance, it's myths and it's stigma. Yeah. So, you know, that thinking that people with dementia will change and won't be the person that you once knew, well, I'm not the person I was yesterday. And when I was 20, I wasn't the person I was. When and I was it's 15. also making that about, it's about other people, not about you anyway. Yeah, so it's like, okay it's, for like... everybody else to change as people. Yes. Can't people with dementia mm. will change. But I also believe strongly that because people with dementia, when they're diagnosed, we're not provided with adequate emotional support or grief and loss counselling. And I spent nine and a half years volunteering in suicide, grief and loss after my partner died um, because that was how he died. Uh, and, you know, we had a lot of people come to us who'd maybe had a bereavement that was five or ten years old who'd been on antidepressants ever since their husband son wife or daughter had taken their life and then they decided they should come off their antidepressants and they went straight back into almost the beginning of their grief yeah and once they got emotional support and grief counseling mm. they weren't depressed anymore depression mm. is actually a normal response to grief and loss Mm. So when you suddenly lose the capacity to maybe, well, for me, it was remembering how to get around uni, remembering how to spell that, remembering what psychology meant, and I was studying a psychology degree, I had a near photographic memory and a relatively healthy IQ. That was devastating for me. Yeah. And then to be told, go home and just get ready to die, of course, I spiralled into deep sadness. Yes. Yes. But luckily for the university, and they provided me with a psychologist to help me with the emotional change. So if everybody that was told they had dementia and their yeah. families were supported like that, lots of people wouldn't change so much. They wouldn't fall into apathy and depression. They mm. possibly would get back to living, maybe differently but they might stick to living. Yeah. So that, 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 that sense of being able to kind of provide that spiritual conversation yeah. um, as they're starting to access aged care services and having to go through this transition um, could be a useful, a useful thing for everybody. It, it helps them to reconnect and articulate what it is that they've 
perhaps always known but not known about themselves exactly yeah and um and and it helps the people who are around them to to know what's important to them so that if yeah, they that's really feel important. like they need to reach out and engage they know how to do that yeah and yeah. and i think i do and having worked in aged care not for very long because i moved into operating theaters but having worked there but also having um had to find nursing homes for three people and been through that whole horrible disempowering admission process and you know my father-in-law up until he'd be he needed well he he wasn't coping at home he didn't want to live with us he didn't we were going to buy the house next door to us a unit and didn't want that so we said well dad you know will we help find a nursing home for you and he agreed to that but then every day we saw him, which was often, he said, you've locked me in jail. What are you doing that? Why have I been locked in jail? They told me it was my home for the rest of my life. But he, he'd been a fit, healthy person riding a push bike 25 kilometres most days of the week. And when he was admitted, they didn't want him in the meeting to talk about his likes and needs. Oh. And I said, well, sure, he's been my father-in-law for a long time and he'd been my son's father for a long time, but I know some of the musical things he likes. I, I know some food that he likes, but I don't know most of it. And it took a lot of demanding to have him present at that meeting. They just wanted him to settle in and then don't come back for eight to ten weeks, otherwise it'll be difficult for him. We weren't going to abandon him, so we kept going back every single day, sometimes twice a day because we lived close yeah. by. But that's such bad advice. No wonder people get depressed and anxious and lash out because they're lonely, they're angry. They're very normal human responses to having been moved very from the normal. home they loved. Very normal, yeah. Very normal. But they're now, you know, mm -hmm. they're labelled BPSD. I believe wrongly, um, probably. Ilsa would know that conversation if she was here. Um, I, I just don't believe it exists. I believe some people have neuropsychiatric symptoms that have been caused by some of the dementias and the rest of those symptoms are unmet needs, bad care, no care, being no grief and loss counselling, being forced out of their own homes. Um, not knew it, not knowing on. who they are anymore. Not yeah. Because the dementia and, and the diagnosis but because they can't they don't have access to what used to fill them with exactly and, and for older couples or any couple who's been separated mm. well suddenly they've been forced into being separated mm. like I, i've been through a, a divorce and that, that was a choice but to be forced into separation if you've been in a 60-year loving relationship and then not to be able to follow your own, if you have a, a religious belief or faith, not to be able to follow that, not to be given the food that fits your culture and your yeah. spirituality. That's yeah. hugely important. Isn't it? Food and, and, and meaning. You know, I think that's a basic love. Yeah. 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 Um, and, you know, and, and to be made to get out of bed, to have a shower at 6 o'clock in the morning, if you've always slept until 10, or, you know, in my case, I often get up at 3 a.m., you know, I'd probably be strapped down. So, you know, there's, there is no autonomy in, in aged care. And, you know, I often say what we want for those we love is safety and what we want for ourselves is autonomy. But that quest for safety and being risk of adversive yes. it, it has, is done a lot of harm. It's done a lot of harm to people. Um, but the denial of spirituality is doing huge harm to people and their families. Yes, we're, 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 we're doing our best. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I don't know about your tool, so I'll be very, I tried to have a look, uh, you know, oh. yeah, I looked onto your website to have a look about yes. it. I don't know very much about it. So I will share that with you. I will share that. That would be great. You. Yeah. Um, and I, look, I know we're, oh, we're absolutely running out of time, so we will wrap it up. Um, I guess you're, you're part of an extraordinary network of people, both just because of the chapters in your life so far, um, the fact that you obviously know a lot of people living with dementia, um, and you know a lot of people who are living with people who are living with dementia. Mm. 
can you think of um, just to just to end our session today? Um, you know, an example of something you've seen or heard of of spiritual care in action. Um, gosh, I haven't been volunteering. I used to volunteer in the nursing homes where my family and friends were. Um, so I suppose I saw it in action quite a lot there from the volunteers more than from the paid staff because they're understaffed and they're so busy doing tasks. Mm -hmm. They don't tend to have time for that extra care. Um, apart from, you know, we're all going to church on Sunday and what if your faith is different to that and your spirituality doesn't include church? Um, yeah. So I think, you know, seeing uh, an elderly gentleman sit down next to a lady who I'd been told was nonverbal and he spent hours with her and eventually she talked. Um, and to me, that was spirituality in action and just yeah. gentle, gentle kindness, um, yeah. which is what and we all presence. need. presence. Yeah. 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 Oh, that's lovely. You've given me goosebumps again. <laughs> oh, I, I had an interesting, uh, one more thing. I had a really interesting lesson as a young nurse working in aged care. Uh, and I was told this lady was mute and not to waste my time on her. Uh, and that to me um, and those who know me will probably smile. Uh, that's like red ray to a ball for me. Yep. So that meant I purposely spent more time with her. <laughs> Every spare minute I had, I'd, I'd share with her and I'd talk to her like I was talking, like I'm talking to you now. Yeah. And I, I was in the loo with her one day and, uh, you know, nurses are busy people. And I said, oh, we'll call her Nelly. Um, could you, could you please hurry up and have a wee? And she looked at me and winked and she said, you can go and have a wee for yourself. <laughs> and I said, I knew you were in there. Why won't you talk out on the ward? And she said, they treat me like I'm a moron. Why would I waste my breath? And that was such a powerful lesson for me, Jackie. Yeah. I've never forgotten it. Yeah. And she only talked to me in the bathroom or the washroom until I left that job. So, you know, she'd, she'd been an, an elite athlete, never married, beautifully groomed, um, articulate woman. Mm. But she didn't share that with most or well, any of the other staff because she felt like they treated her like an idiot. So, you know, I, I think if we can all treat each other as equal human beings with kindness, yes. then, then we could change the world. Yes, talk to the people, not the diagnosis. Exactly, yeah. Or, your, or your, your preconceived ideas about the diagnosis. Yeah. yeah, see the me in dementia, mm. definitely. Oh, yeah, perfect. Yeah. Perfect. That's Thanks a so much, Thanks so much, Kate, again, for joining us. We'd love to have you back, I think, next year. Absolutely, um, my pleasure. Wow. <laughs> um, and that's um, used up pretty much all of our time. In fact, we are just a, a tiny bit over, but uh, I hope you can stay with me just for one or two more minutes. I'd like to acknowledge, um, you know, my colleague, Jackie, who jumped in at the last minute to have that conversation with Kate and, and well done. And it's a proud moment for me to see the team taking the vision forward. This is my last ever webinar with Meaningful Ageing Australia. Many of you know I'm finishing up with the organisation after six years. On the 9th of February is my last day. I wanted to acknowledge um, some of the conversation in the chat. And absolutely, this is a big, complex area. There are things from Kate's experience which maybe don't reflect um, the experience of the people in the room. Um, I think, you know, we've had a huge amount of interest in this session. So we're absolutely encouraged that um, our network is very keen to hear more, to talk more, to share more. And if you don't know any examples of where people with dementia are being marginalised or mistreated, that is fantastic. That means you're in some really wonderful uh, networks that are doing the right thing. And so please share what you know and encourage and uh, you know spread the word so that we don't have any more stories about people being uh, marginalised or not seen or heard because of their diagnosis. I was really struck by how um, Kate when um, they were talking about spirituality fairly on early on in the conversation, Kate used the words being at home. 
And I think if through our spiritual care, we can enable every single person to feel they are at home, then we're really getting somewhere. Thank you all again. Uh, the recording, of course, will be available to people who'd like to catch up on it later. Next year, we've got an amazing program already organised. It includes engagement with people who are living with dementia. We've got a community of practice where you can really wrestle and, and discuss some of the issues that you're facing in your work. Watch out for the calendar events that's coming out uh, in about a week or so. Please put uh, the dates in your diary because I know that there's a lot to do and together we will be able to get there. Thanks, everyone. See you later.